her kind. I have gone out a possessed witch, haunting the black air, braver at night, dreaming evil. I have done my hitch over the plain houses, light by light. Lonely thing, twelve-fingered, out of mind. A woman like that is not a woman quite. I have been her kind. I have found the warm caves in the woods, filled them with skillets, carvings, shelves, closets, silks, innumerable goods, fixed the suppers for the worms and the elves, whining, rearranging the disallowed. A woman like that is misunderstood. I have been her kind. I have ridden in your cart, driver, waved my nude arms at villages going by, learning the last bright roots, survivor where your flames still bite my thigh, and my ribs crack where your wheels whine. A woman like that is not ashamed to die. I have been her kind. NET presents USA Poetry. This is a film about the poet Anne Sexton. I had a nervous breakdown. And after it, you know, I said, oh, I kept saying, I'm so dumb, I can't do anything. My mother was a very brilliant woman. And my psychiatrist suggested that uh, I watched Channel 2. You have an educational te uh, television there. Why don't you look at it? So I did, and I.A. Richards was uh, explaining the form of a sonnet. And I thought, oh, so that's a sonnet. So I sat down and tried to write one. It was a pretty bad thing. And that just turned me on, and then I, you know, turned on. And wrote like mad. For, you know, I used to stay up to stay at this desk. First it was a card table, because I didn't think I was the poet. When I put a desk, it was in our dining room then. I had no place to work like this lovely place. Our dining room was a mess. We could never entertain papers, books, everything. Then I put up some bookshelves, and everything was tentative. But uh, I used to stay here from, well, every minute that I wasn't taking care of the kids until 3 in the morning. I'd drag upstairs, and then get up at 6, take care of the kids. Working and working and working on a poem that, you know, was no good, of course, but I had to learn that one. There's one poem that I wrote in... Well, there's one poem in this manuscript that is an old poem that I wouldn't give up. And I... And it says, June... Let's see. That's October. Everything is... It's an old poem, and I wouldn't let go of it. This one is Self in 1958. Well, this is that poem, only now I know how to write it a little bit better. It still has the same simplicity. It was written in a very simple style. But I... It's rather a good defining poem of me. What is reality? I am a plaster doll. I pose with eyes that cut open without landfall or nightfall upon some shellacked and grinning person. Eyes that open blue steel and close. Am I approximately an eye magnet transplant? I have hair, black angel, black angel stuffing to comb, nylon legs, luminous arms, and some advertised clothes. I live in a doll's house with four chairs, a counterfeit table, a flat roof, and a big front door. Many have come to such a small crossroad. There is an iron bed. Life enlarges, life takes aim a cardboard floor, windows that flash open upon someone's city, and little more. Someone plays with me, plants me in the all-electric kitchen. Is this what Mrs. Rombar said? Someone pretends with me. I am walled in solid by their noise, or puts me upon their straight bed. They think I am me. Their warmth, their warmth is not a friend. They pry my mouth for their cups of gin and their stale bread. What is reality to this synthetic doll who should smile, who should shift gears, should spring the doors open in wholesome disorder and have no evidence of ruin or fears? But I would cry, rooted into the wall that was once my mother, if I could remember how and if I had the tears. 
That's how many, that's a long amount of time to... But the, essentially, that was a poem that I saved from then, you know, and rescued, you know, out of, out of the chaos of way back then. You know, although I did get very manic once, and they told me I was psychotic in the hospital, and I thought that was a riot, because I was still me. You know, I thought psychotic was someplace else, but I was still me. And I talked to my friend on the, they had a little payphone on the nut house, it was MGH, actually, a ward they have in there. And uh, I was still me, and I used to talk with her and tell her what was going on. I'd call my kids, and they were at camp, and I'd say, I want to tell you what we had for lunch today. You know, so they'd feel in touch with me and what was going on. When they saw the OT, if you know, occupational therapy room, they said, what a great crass room. Ringing the bells. And this is the way they ring the bells in Bedlam. And this is the bell lady who comes each Tuesday morning to give us a music lesson. And because the attendants make you go, and because we mind by instinct, like bees caught in the wrong hive, we are the circle of the crazy ladies who sit in the lounge of the mental house and smile at the smiling woman who passes us each a bell, who points at my hand that holds my bell, E-flat. And this is the gray dress next to me, who grumbles as if it were special to be old, to be old. And this is the small hunched squirrel girl on the other side of me who picks at the hairs over her lip, who picks at the hairs over her lip all day. And this is how the bells really sound, as untroubled and clean as a workable kitchen. And this is always my bell responding to my hand that responds to the lady who points at me E flat. And although we are no better for it, they tell you to go. And you do. Anne Sexton, American poet, writes, I was born in Newton, Massachusetts, and I spent most of my life on the coast of Maine. In the summer, or wintering in Wellesley, Newton, and Weston, all suburban towns west of Boston. My ancestor, William Brewster, came to America on the Mayflower and sounds like a decent sort of man from what I've read of him. My family tree goes back, I have lately found, to assortments of royalty, such as William the Conqueror, King Edward III, second first, King Philip IV of France, King Ferdinand of Spain, etc. This list amuses me most when I find such notes in the family genealogy as Edward III, founded the Knights of the Garter, married Philippa of Hainault, his mistress, age 15. Mistress of 15. Ah, those were the days. I was a third and last daughter. As a young child, I was locked in my room until the age of five. After that, at school, I did not understand the people who were my size or even the larger ones. Thus, I hid in fairy tales and read them daily like a prayer book. I did not even like my dolls, for they resembled people. I wrote some poems in high school, but stopped when my mother suggested that I had plagiarized them. My mother was brilliant and vital. One thought in meeting her that she had written all the first editions in her own library. She collected first editions. Of course, I was unbearable, unhappy, unreachable, and as soon as possible, I became boy crazy. In fact, I eloped at 19 with Alfred M. Sexton. As a matter of interest, I'm still married to him. I found this somewhat unusual among writers in general. Fairy tales we all have in common, but one marriage seldom. Young. A thousand doors ago, when I was a lonely kid, in a big house with four garages, and it was summer as long as I could remember. I lay on the lawn at night, clover wrinkling under me, the wise stars bedding over me, my mother's window a funnel of yellow heat running out, my father's window half shut, and I where sleepers pass. And the boards of the house were smooth and white as wax, and probably a million leaves sailed on their strange stalks as the crickets ticked together. And I, in my brand new body, which was not a woman's yet, told the stars my questions and thought God could really see the heat and the painted light, elbows, knees, dreams, good night. Those times... At six, I lived in a graveyard full of dolls, avoiding myself, my body, the suspect in its grotesque house. Was locked in my room all day behind a gate, a prison cell. 
I was the exile who sat all day in a knot. I will speak of the little childhood cruelties being a third child, the last given and the last taken, of the nightly humiliations when mother undressed me, of the life of the daytime locked in my room, being the unwanted, the mistake that mother used to keep father from his divorce. Divorce, the romantic's friend, romantics who fly into maps of other countries, hips and noses in mountains, into Asia or the Black Forest, or caught by 1928, the year of the me, by mistake, not for divorce, but instead. The me who refused to suck on breasts she couldn't please, the me whose body grew unsurely, the me who stepped on the noses of dolls she couldn't break. I think of the dolls, so well made, so perfectly put together, as I pressed them against me, kissing their little imaginary mouths. I remember their smooth skin, those newly delivered, the pink skin and the serious china blue eyes. They came from a mysterious country, without the pang of birth, born quietly and well. When I wanted to visit, the closet is where I rehearsed my life, all day among shoes, away from the glare of the bulb in the ceiling, away from the bed and the heavy table and the same terrible rows repeating on the walls. I did not question it. I hid in the closet as one hides in a tree. I grew into it like a root, and yet I planned such plans of flight, believing I would take my body into the sky, dragging it with me like a large bed. And although I was unskilled, I was sure to get there, or at least to move up like an elevator. With such dreams, storing their energy like a bull, I planned my growth and my womanhood as one choreographs a dance. I knew that if I waited among shoes, I was sure to outgrow them the heavy Oxfords, the thick execution reds, shoes that lay together like partners, the sneakers thick with griffin eyewash, and then the dresses swinging above me, always above me, empty and sensible with sashes and puffs, with collars and two-inch hems, and evil fortunes in their belts. I sat all day stuffing my heart into a shoebox, avoiding the precious window, as if it were an ugly eye through which birds coughed, chained to the heaving trees, avoiding the wallpaper of the room where tongues bloomed over and over, bursting from lips like sea flowers. And in this way, I waited out the day until my mother, the large one, came to force me to undress. I lay there silently, hoarding my small dignity. I did not ask about the gate or the closet. I did not question the bedtime ritual where, on the cold bathroom tiles, I was spread out daily and examined for flaws. I did not know that my bones, those solids, those pieces of sculpture would not splinter. I did not know the woman I would be, nor that blood would bloom in me each month like an exotic flower, nor that children, two monuments, would break from between my legs, two cramped girls breathing carelessly, each asleep in her tiny beauty. I did not know that my life in the end would run over my mother's like a truck, and all that would remain from the year I was six was a small hole in my heart, a deaf spot, so that I might hear the unsaid more clearly. It's terrible. It's very sad for my kids. And the witch isn't really that bad. They paint her pink. That's just because they're so beautiful. I'm very lucky to have those children. Even though I can get mad at them or, you know, any of that. Still, they were the one who taught, they taught me how to be a mother. Because I hadn't, I hadn't had any mothering, so I didn't really know. They're the good things, the big presence of my life. So I have to find Mr. Taylor. Give me a kiss. Can we kiss across the bridge? I love you. I do. 
And I'm glad you talked to her, because she thinks have never been straight. Yeah, but I shouldn't have to. You've got to make it by yourself. Yeah, I know it, but I didn't I didn't know she was just joking like that. And I wasn't even going to tell you, because you were getting but all it, upset about but it. But you're supposed to tell me. You're yeah, supposed to tell me what goes on. But I don't have to fix everything. You've got to learn to fix it. Yeah, Somebody there won't be any. That's why I wasn't going to gonna tell things. you. That's what I wasn't going to I don't to have any mother to call up and say, fix everything. I know. You have me. <laughs> My string piece. Okay. You know, I wanted to give a party because she'd matured. Instead of giving a party, I wrote a poem. Little girl, my string bean, my lovely woman. My daughter at 11, almost 12, is like a garden. Oh, darling, born in that sweet birthday suit and having owned it, and known it for so long. Now you must watch high noon enter, noon at ghost hour. Oh, funny little girl, this one under a blueberry sky, this one, how can I say that I've known just what you know and just where you are? It's not a strange place. This odd home where your face sits in my hand, so full of distance, so full of its immediate fever. The summer has seized you as when, last month in Amalfi, I saw lemons as large as your desk-side globe, that miniature map of the world. And I could mention, too, the market stalls of mushrooms and garlic buds all engorged. Or I think even of the orchard next door where the berries are done, and the apples are beginning to swell. And once with our backyard, I remember I planted an acre of yellow beans we couldn't eat. Oh, little girl, my string bean, how do you grow? You grow this way. You are too many to eat. I hear, as in a dream, the conversation of the old wives Speaking of womanhood, I remember that I heard nothing myself. I was alone. I waited like a target. Let high noon enter the hour of the ghosts. Once the Romans believed that noon was the ghost hour, and I can believe it too under the startling sun. And someday they will come to you. Someday men bear to the waist young Romans at noon where they belong, with ladders and hammers while no one sleeps. But before they enter, I will have said, your bones are lovely. And before their strange hands, there was always this hand that formed. Oh, darling, let your body in. Let it tie you in, in comfort. What I want to say, Linda, is that women are born twice. If I could have watched you grow as a magical mother might, if I could have seen through my magical transparent belly, there would have been such ripening within. Your embryo, the seed taking on its own, life clapping the bedpost, bones from the pond, thumbs and two mysterious eyes the awfully human head, the heart jumping like a puppy, the important lungs, the becoming while it becomes, as it does now, a world of its own, a delicate place. I say hello to such shakes and knockings and hijinks, such music, such sprouts, such dancing mad bears of music, such necessary sugar, such goings on. Oh, little girl, my string bee, how do you grow? You grow this way. You are too many to eat. What I want to say, Linda, is that there is nothing in your body that lies. All that is new is telling the truth. I'm here at somebody else, an old tree in the background, 
darling. Stand still at your door, sure of yourself, a white stone, a good stone. As exceptional as laughter, you will strike fire, that new thing. When I can make a sound like this, this is totally a... Cracked and crazy as it is, listen to that voice. And with those clumsy words, I must try to make it. I can't. That's a voice like a flute, you know, or a songbird, or... I don't mean to sound... It's the way I feel, really, inside. Silly. I mean, I feel ashamed of it, even. And this damn typewriter, all it gives me is words. Don't do that to me. They don't make me cry the way that does. It makes me cry. I like something I've lost. There's something in that that I've lost and that I can't find. The addict, sleep monger, death monger, with capsules in my palms each night, eight at a time from sweet pharmaceutical bottles. I make arrangements for a pint-sized journey. I'm the queen of this condition. I'm an expert on making the trip. And now they say I'm an addict. Now they ask why. Why? Don't you know that I promised to die? I'm keeping in practice. I'm merely staying in shape. The pills are a mother, but better, every color, and as good as sour balls. I'm on a diet from death. Yes, I admit it has gotten to be a bit of a habit. Blows eight at a time, sucked in the eye, hauled away by the pink, the orange, the green, and the white good nights. I'm becoming something of a chemical mixture. That's it. My supply of tablets has got to last for years and years. I like them more than I like me. Stubborn as hell, they won't let go. It's a kind of marriage. It's a kind of war where I plant bombs inside of myself. Yes, I try to kill myself in small amounts. An innocuous occupation. Actually, I'm hung up on it. But remember, I don't make too much noise. And frankly, no one has to lug me out. And I don't stand there in my winding sheet. I'm a little buttercup in my yellow nighty, eating my eight loaves in a row, and in a certain order, as in the laying on of hands, or the black sacrament. It's a ceremony, but like any other sport, it's full of rules. It's like a musical tennis match where my mouth keeps catching the ball. Then I lie on my altar, elevated by the eight chemical kisses. What a lay-me-down this is with the two pink too orange, too green, too white, good nights. It's a sleep, it's a sleep you can keep. Live or die, but don't poison everything. Live. Well, death's been here for a long time. It has a hell of a lot to do with hell and suspicion of the eye and the religious objects and how I mourned them when I made them obscene with my dwarf heart's doodle. The chief ingredient is mutilation and mud day after day, mud like a ritual and the baby on the platter cooked but still human, cooked also with little maggots sewn onto it maybe by somebody's mother the damn bitch. Even so, I kept right on going on, a sort of human statement, lugging myself as if I were the sawed-off body in the trunk, the steamer trunk. This became a perjury of the soul. It became an outright lie, and even though I dressed the body, it was still naked, still killed. It was caught in the first place at birth like a fish. 
But I played it, dressed it up, dressed it up like somebody's doll. Is life something you play? And all the time wanting to get rid of it? And further, everyone yelling at you to shut up? And no wonder people don't like to be told that you're sick and then be forced to watch you come down with a hammer. Today, life opened inside me like an egg. And there inside, after considerable digging, I found the answer. What a bargain! There was the sun, her yoke moving feverishly, tumbling her prize. And you realize that she does this daily? I'd known she was a purifier, but I hadn't thought she was solid. Hadn't known she was an answer. God, it's a dream. Lovers sprouting in the yard like celery stalks. And better, a husband straight as a redwood. Two daughters, two sea urchins, picking roses off my hackles. If I'm on fire, they dance around it and cook marshmallows. And if I'm ice, they simply skate on me in little ballet costumes. Here, all along, thinking I was a killer, anointing myself daily with my little poisons. But no, I'm an empress. I wear an apron. My typewriter writes. It didn't break the way it warned. Even crazy, I'm as nice as a chocolate bar. Even with the witch's gymnastics, they trust my incalculable city, my corruptible bed. Oh, dearest three, I make a soft reply. The witch comes on, and you paint her pink. I come with kisses in my hood, and the, sm and the sun, the smart one, rolling in my arms. So I say, live, and turn my shadow three times round to feed our puppies as they come. The eight Dalmatians we didn't drown, despite the warnings, the abort, the destroy, despite the pails of water that waited to drown them, to pull them down like stones, they came, each one head first, blowing bubbles the color of cataract blue and fumbling for the tiny tits. Just last week, eight Dalmatians, three quarters of a pound, lined up like cordwood, each like a birch tree. I promise to love more if they come, because in spite of cruelty and the stuffed railroad cars for the ovens, I am not what I expected. Not an Eichmann. The poison just didn't take. So I won't hang around in my hospital shift, repeating the black mass and all of it. I say, live, live, because of the sun, the dream, the excitable gift. Books by Anne Sexton include To Bedlam and Part One, published by Houghton Mifflin in 1960, All My Pretty Ones, by the same publisher in 1962, Selected Poems, Oxford University Press, 1965, and the most recent collection, Live or Die, to be published by Houghton Mifflin in 1966. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.